Bailey. He is the executive director of the Alaka Alliance. Really cool word, right? Yeah. So this comes from a Chinook Indian word for sea otter. So really great way to pull your name. Uh, they're a nonprofit organization that restores sea otters, um, looking to restore sea otters in Oregon. We're all behind you. And the health of Oregon's near shore marine ecosystems. <laughs> Um, so it looks like you are working with uh, local Indian tribes, conservation agencies, uh, academic institutions, community groups, individuals, anybody who wants to rally around this idea of helping to create a more holistic ecosystem, because you'll probably learn from this uh, presentation that there are I some problems. So. Yeah. <laughs> so part of their action plan is to tell the story of the sea otters in Oregon coast um, and their importance to a healthy marine ecosystem and also to our coastal communities. So. I'd like to uh, have you all welcome me and uh, bring in Bob Bailey. All right. Because I'm. Are, are we on? Are we rolling, Bob? Normally I carry a little hip flask of gin just for my throat. You know? I'm not going to do that tonight. So, first of all, thank you very much for. Greeting and for everybody turning out tonight, this is great. Uh, with daylight saving time, it seems like we're in the middle of the afternoon, but it really is evening. Uh, I want to recognize a couple people in the audience first. Uh, Paul Sherman over here is a resident up on Cape Sebastian who is on our board of directors. So this is the first time he's gotten to see this presentation in action. But it's been a wonderful to have Paul on board. He's a retired. Uh, a research biologist from uh, Cornell University and brings all kinds of energy and information and enthusiasm and good contacts in the science community to our work. Uh, I want to introduce my traveling companion for today, who you, many of you know, Harry Hugestager. Yeah! Harry. I, picked, I picked Harry up at his house in Corvallis this morning about quarter after eight and we yakety yacked all the way and suddenly we were in Gold Beach five or six hours later, so we had a great drive down the coast this morning. I want to thank Harry for all of that. And he filled me in on the dirt about a lot of people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and last, I want to recognize my old friend, uh, who you may know, Carl Popoff. His honor. <laughs> Carl and I go back further than either of us care to admit, but I think 1954 rings a bell. Yeah. And we grew up together, went to grade school, junior high, high school together, and have stayed in touch low these many years. He's helped me out a lot in things that I've been done professionally over the years. He's always been very supportive. So I want to thank Carl for his friendship and support over the years. You're, you're lucky to have him as your mayor. Oh, yeah. Now with that out, <laughs> and it's true, I, I, have, I have always had a fond affection for Carl, even if he did beat me in tennis. <laughs> So I, I, I told Paul tonight, I'm gonna just I'm gonna tell a story. And we start stories with once upon a time. And there's a lot of chapters to this story. Uh, it's a long, it's a long book, really. And there's lots of little bunny trails and side stories to tell, but I'm gonna try to keep on track here, down through introducing the animal and their history, uh, the, the previous attempts at reintroduction talk about sea otters out in the world today, why we even care about sea otters. Yes, they're cute, but there's more than that. And uh, what might happen if they were to come back, and the considerations that we are uh, trying to address, and then a little bit about our organization. So let's introduce Alaka, the animal itself. So Alaka, sea otters, uh, as the name implies, live in the ocean nearly all the time. They, they carry, as we would say in uh, home health care, their activities of daily living, their ADLs, are all done in the water, uh, usually on their back or underwater. They are totally at home in the marine environment, and they propel themselves with extra large hind feet. They are not a large animal. In fact, I like to think of them as a, about the size of a German Shepherd dog. You know, 60, 80, maybe 100 pounds uh, with various individuals and about the same size and shape. They are much larger, about, about three times larger than a river otter. And we'll talk more about that in, in a minute. They're very social animals. They live in cohorts. 
uh, all, all their life. They, their friends, their cousins, their offspring. Um, so you'll see them in, in uh, large groups that are called rafts, as in Tom Sawyer and the raft, right? A distinctive feature of them, which led almost to their doom, is that they have no fat and no blubber. And so instead, to keep warm in this cold marine environment, they have this very, very dense fur, probably the densest fur of any animal in the world, up to a million hairs per square inch, or 100,000 hairs uh, per square centimeter. And it's not really the hairs that keep them warm, it's the air that's trapped inside that that insulates them against the cold. But the other way that they keep warm in this environment without blubber is that they're eating machines. They need to eat between 25 and 30 percent of their body weight a day. So if you think about a 90 pound animal, that's eating 30 pounds of typically shellfish every day. Uh, so, or a 75 pound animal eating 25 pounds, that's a lot. So, they eat, they dive, they come back up, they eat, they dive, they come back up to keep their metabolic fires burning. Whoop, did we go that? We already did that one. There we go. So, their diet is primarily shellfish. Rarely they will catch a little uh, flounder or something, a small sole is on the bottom, but typically they, they want to dive and catch food as quickly as possible so they go back up. So it's the shellfish that are fairly stationary that they're, they're eating. They take these to the surface, they break them open and eat them there, and they often will carry a little rock in the pouches under their arm from the bottom to the surface and put the rock on their chest and then whack their urchin and the clam or whatever it is on the shell on the rock to break it open. And once open, their teeth are like our molars. They're very much adapted to grinding uh, and chewing on, on uh, these shells, as opposed to, say, river otters that have incisor sharp teeth for tearing flesh. So these things are uh, built for and adapted to eating shellfish. Here's another part that really is key to their life history and how they think about potential reintroduction. And that's the sea otter moms raise their pups one at a time. Rarely there are two uh, pups that will be born, but moms can't sustain that much energy to feed two pups, so typically one of them will die. But they raise their pups one at a time. They do everything. They teach the pup how to dive, how to open their food, how to find the food, how to groom themselves. And the pups are basically little bobbing corks until uh, later in life when the mother teaches them what to do. The other thing is that that dictates their life history is that sea otter moms spend a lot of energy feeding that pup. They're essentially eating for two. She's eating to keep herself warm. She's eating to keep a growing pup warm and, uh, and growing. So that requires a lot of calories and the moms will dive. You think the males eat a lot of food. The moms have to eat even more. So they're diving, coming to the surface, feeding themselves, feeding the pup. And so they don't go anywhere. Sea otters do not migrate. In fact, they don't really move around very much. A sea otter, for instance, in one location might not ever meet other sea otters four or five miles away just because they don't move around. So that fact that the sea otter moms don't migrate and they don't really move is one key reason why they haven't really spread south of their range in the Olympic Peninsula or north from their range uh, south of San Francisco. That's a long ways. So the question comes up about sea otters or river otters. We, uh, I've talked to a lot of people since I began this little project who say they've seen sea otters and actually it turns out that they've seen river otters. So here's a quick primer on the difference and I put the, uh, the same thing back on the table so you can look at it later. But, Sea otters are much larger than river otters. They're buoyant, they're high in the water, whereas river otters are much lower and swim on their bellies. Uh, river otters, or excuse me, sea otters are on their back and much more buoyant. There's a bunch of other differences, but um, one of which is the sea otters typically do not come up on the beach, whereas river otters will hump down to the beach, feed in the inner tidal, they might even swim along in the waves right off, off the beach, and then they'll come back again. Sea otters, uh, that's not sea otter behavior. Next chapter. So once they were here, 
They were part of a contiguous population that stretched all the way from the uh, northern islands of Japan all the way up to the Kamchatka Peninsula, uh, Aleutian Islands down the west coast as far south as Baja, California. The actual number of those animals on the Oregon coast is unknown. It's likely it was not large because compared to other areas, the potential habitat here is much more limited. So how do we know they were here? There's four basic pathways. One is the stories of the elders in the coastal Indian community whose word for alaka, for the sea otter, we take today. And uh, so that word shows up in their language. It shows up in the stories that they told the ethnographers in the 20s and 30s who came to interview them. And it shows up in the cultural respect that the tribes show to these animals and still show today. These animals show up in written reports beginning with uh, things like Robert Gray when he showed up in the late 1700s uh, in his ship uh, reporting purchasing 150 sea otter belts near the mouth of the Columbia River. Other reports like Lewis and Clark and other reports in newspapers and articles uh, indicating the presence of sea otters alive or the ones that they've hunted and, and uh, killed for their fur. The geographic place names that we have today are proof, uh, or at least evidence, that they were here. Otter Rock in Lincoln County, the Tillamook Indian word for uh, that, that feature, which I cannot pronounce, means Sea Otter Rock. And likewise, here at Otter Point, just north of Gold Beach, the Dini Indian word in, in, that, in that language also means Sea Otter Rock, and today it's uh, Otter Point. Lastly, it's the bones and teeth found in shell mittens, the, the so-called garbage dumps, from the various village sites up and down the coast. Uh, sea otter bones and teeth are the second most numerous remains of marine mammals. So we know they were here, we know they were here pretty much up and down the, the entire coast. This uh, photograph of the nearly intact skeleton, or most of a skeleton, was uh, excavated from the Nasoma site in Bandon, which is right there on, right across from the uh, uh, port district across from where the farmer's market is. That, that little, some of those little grassy lawns were actually on top of an old village site. And that was a sea otter's tail dug from that site. So after 15,000 years of being in close relationship with the tribes on the coast, suddenly they were gone. In little less than 100 years, these animals were extirpated, which means nearly to extinction, everywhere from northern Japan all the way to Mexico. The Russians uh, started this fur trade for this lucrative fur trade to China for unbelievable wealth. The British got in on the act uh, soon after the American fur traders were uh, late to the party, but uh, contributed. The Spanish down in California were busy hunting them in San Francisco Bay and further down the coast. So, and in, in many ways, if you research this, it's really pretty fascinating that sea otters were a driving <coughs> natural resource wealth issue that drove the geopolitics of Spain, Russia, Great Britain, U.S., and even France over who was going to control this northwest coast. And so you start digging into it, even this, this, the purchase of Alaska from Russia was the fact that Russia more or less ran out of money fighting the... Uh, French, uh, Napoleon, and the sea otters were gone, and they didn't think there was much more value in Alaska, so they sold it to the U.S. to bail themselves out of their financial hole they were in. So sea otters have played a big role in the history of this region. They returned briefly to, to Oregon. There was uh, approximately 90 animals um, reintroduced at either Cape Arago, Redfish Rocks, or Port Orford in 1970 and 71 but by 1981, all had vanished. And what we know about that is that for two years there was no formal surveys, and I thought, what's this little thing popping up here? No, thank you. There were no formal surveys done for almost two years, so we don't really know the dynamics of what happened those first two years. And only eight deaths were reported after release, which is based on carcasses washed up on the beach or otherwise 
to actually found. And typically those things do wash up on the beach and because of their fur, they were well reported. So, and immediately after the release in these areas, pods of sea otters were seen north up along the coast, Pacific City, Tillamook, uh, Clatsop County area. So the, uh, the guess is that many of them just basically decided to swim home, that they were in the wrong spot, so they were going home. Um, but there were, over the, that 10 years, there were seen to be some seasonal concentrations of them at Blanco Reef in the summer and up around uh, Simpson Reef in the winter. And there were pups born during that period of time. So we think that the translocation sites here in the south coast had necessary habitat characteristics and that uh, because popping occur occurred, uh, that was a good sign and that there did appear to be some ad adaptation to um, the, the area. But they were animals were not tagged prior to release, so we don't really have any way of following them. There was no record of their age or condition. Even the sex ratio was unknown. So there's a lot of things that were not done well during that initial, initial uh, transplant. But sea otters are sometimes seen in Oregon. They're, an individual was seen off Cape Arago, reliably seen couple summers ago. Uh, this one was photographed in Schofield Creek up in Reedsport. Talk about being, being lost. Uh, these are typically all young males that uh, are detached from the population on the Olympic coast and drift south looking for a good time as all young males like to do. And this one happened to hang a left and go up the uh, Umpqua looking, looking for downtown Reedsport and went right through it and uh, up Schofield Creek. And the guy that took this photo could hardly believe his eyes. So, uh, and he sent the photo to the Marine Mammal guy, at, or uh, the Marine Mammal Stranding Network guy at OSU, who said, yes, that's a sea otter. <laughs> so, let's talk about sea otters today on the West Coast and where are they? Yes, there's a population in California, and many of you have seen those in Monterey or further south in the Big Sur area, Memorial Bay, etc., when you go down there. These are remnants of a population that survived the hunting. And there's a little yellow splash there on the map at Bixby Creek, where that beautiful arch bridge is. There was a population that survived at Bixby Creek of about 50 animals that today is the source for the population that has now grown to about 3,000 animals. But that, that population has been at that level now for more than a decade, and it has been basically within the range that you see here with the red line from just north of, of uh, Santa Cruz to just around the point of Point Conception. And there are real concerns among sea otter conservationists and managers that that population uh, is unable to expand its range and is uh, basically trapped there. The Washington population likewise has uh, grown from some reintroductions on the Olympic coast where those two yellow dots are and today is between uh, the, the northern tip of the peninsula there at uh, Nia Bay. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I think so. And then down towards Grace Harbor. And that population has grown to about uh, pushing 3,000, a little over 2,500 animals. Similarly, up in, in uh, British Columbia, there were some reintroductions done on, on uh, Vancouver Island. There's a yellow dot there you may be able to see, but today those have spread along the northwest uh, coast of the Vancouver Island, and a few of them have actually, for some reason, uh, have been able to make their way across to the, the mainland. And those may be animals drifting down from the north too, but the population in, in uh, British Columbia is now uh, in the 6,000 animal range. Notice that they have not made it out to Haida Gwaii, the large island, way off to the left, the one that we used to call Queen Charlotte Island. Southeast Alaska, though, is sea otter heaven. And uh, today that population has grown from animals that survived in Prince William Sound and animals that were translocated from the Aleutian Islands to about 25,000 animals, which is a lot of, of uh, sea otters, in Southeast Alaska, which is the green area. And here's a reason why. If you look at, and many of you have been up there, I'm sure, but the way the geography of Southeast Alaska means, as I say, this is sea otter heaven. Anywhere a sea otter swims, any direction, is potential habitat. Whereas here, you've got to drive 
I mean, if, there, if a sea otter were here, it would have to swim a long way south or a long ways north. If they go west, they're in trouble and they can't go east. So in southeast Alaska, there are so many opportunities that they've really taken off there. It's sheltered, a lot of habitat, relatively shallow in areas where that can support these animals. So the population there has really boomed. So the question is, did their disappearance matter? I mean, we've lived without them here now for, functionally, for 100, 150 years. Does it really matter that they're not here? And our answer is yes, it matters in two ways. And the first one is the cultural loss to the tribes who lived here with the otters in close cultural relationship, close almost family relationship, for 15,000 years until both cult and native people and sea otters were removed from their homes. We believe it's important to bring and reestablish that cultural connection and respect between people and the sea otter. The other way that their, their loss matters is the ecological loss. And this is the one we want to drill down on a little bit here. They are absolutely essential to the diversity and productivity of the marine and the estuarine ecosystems. And these systems provide all the basic uh, values, the variety of foods, that we eat fish, shellfish, uh, and that the people themselves at that time ate year-round. And that's because a, the sea otters are a keystone species, and that means a species that plays this predominant, this inordinately important role in the structure and function of the surrounding ecological community. And they do that in a way that they effectively become guardians of the kelp forest. And this is the whole point for us, is that yes, sea otters are cute, but it's really about the ecosystem. Sea otters guard the kelp, and how do they do that? They eat sea urchins among their prey. And sea urchins, if left, left unchecked, will mow down, graze down the kelp. So why do we care about kelp? Well, if you've lived here any, any period of time, you know how important kelp is. It creates this complex three-dimensional habitat and structure within the marine environment that's otherwise just open flowing water. So and what does that do? That creates substrate on the leaves themselves for critters to eat and to live. Uh, the kelp detritus, the, the leaves that break off, help to feed uh, uh, all kinds of marine life within these kelp forests. They buffer ocean waves up on the, the shore and they capture and store carbon. So if sea otters are absent, what we're seeing is an expansion of urchin barrens. And let me talk a little bit about that, because these are showing up now, even, I'm going to jump past this quickly, to show you this, these two photos from Port Orford. The one on the left is taken with a GoPro camera in water right off the, the, the beach there, Port Orford, as part of a gray whale monitoring program. It shows a rock with kelp and other seaweeds growing on it. This is from June 2016. That's the same rock in, in August of 2018 being overrun by sea urchins. So why is, why is that the case? Kelp beds are under pressure up and down the coast, and you may have read even prior to this about the, the Purple Plague uh, in Northern California and some of the communities, uh, Fort Bragg and others, being very concerned about the loss of kelp forest and the spread of sea urchins. Uh, not only are sea otters, have sea otters been absent from this area, the backup mechanism to protect from uh, these urchin predation has been the sea stars. And about four or five years ago, there was a, this over, almost overnight mysterious so-called sea star wasting disease that affected sea stars from British Columbia all the way to Mexico almost overnight, and even included in aquaria, Seattle Aquarium and other aquariums that pump seawater from the ocean, affected the starfish in their tanks and their aquariums. The thought is that, I mean, people still don't really know what happened, but that condition seemed to be um, triggered by warm water. Uh, whether it was a virus, we're not sure. But the long story short is those giant sun it affected not only the sea stars we see in the intertidal area, which have started to come back, but
with these Pycnopodia, the larger sunflower, sun stars in deeper water that really f feed on the urchins, those things are, are gone. There, there are very few being found off the coast of British Columbia, but they're effectively gone from Oregon. So without those predators on sea urchins and those sea otters on sea urchins, this is what we get. So it's our, our uh, hypothesis, our story, our advocacy, that bringing back sea otters will help to restore these uh, kelp beds, which are so important to us. And we also know that those kelp beds are primarily along the south coast. Yeah, there's kelp in some limited areas up you know, Depot Bay, um, Seal or Otter Rock, up north of Newport, uh, Cape uh, Lookout, way up the coast. But most of the kelp beds are here. And a lot of that is off Orford Reef, uh, Blanco Reef, Cape Blanco, but also Crook Point, Mac Reef, uh, spread up and down the coast. One of the other things that has come to light over the last few years is that kelp forests sequester a huge amount of carbon in the end. The estimate is that if you look at the, the bar on the, on the left, a kelp forest will store pushing a ton of carbon per acre. Whereas without kelp in a sea urchin barrack, you're looking at about 20 pounds per acre. So if you aggregate the areas of, of uh, potential kelp forest, yeah, it's a small fraction of the Earth's surface, but every bit counts in terms of sequestering carbon from oceans and atmospheres. Beyond that, sea otters and kelp benefit the beach. We've all seen the rack of kelp after a storm, giant piles up on the beach. And sometimes we even cut them into little trumpets and run around playing tunes on them. <laughs> but what, as these things decay, laying there on the beach, little insects feed on them. The insects are eaten by other little critters, amphipods and so on. Pretty soon birds are in there eating those little critters. And then sometimes birds, like this peregrine falcon, even feed on those on the birds that eat the insects. Nutrients from kelp rack has been found in uh, beach grass along the edge of the beach and in some of the shrubbery. So these nutrients are coming up out of the ocean by way of kelp and contributing to the nu nu nutrients that run our beach ecosystem as well. Results from California, scientific results show that uh, sea otters benefit estuaries too, in much the same way that if you think about your aquarium at home, you need to have little snails, right, to keep the algae off the glass, to uh, all the little doodads you've got inside. It. And you try to keep uh, some plants in the aquarium to keep the oxygen pumping. Well, if there's no snails, algae takes over. Those plants die, and the whole thing goes uh, haywire on you. Same thing in an estuary. There are lots of little grazers that graze on the leaves of eelgrass, which are important habitat. But if, and sea otters help to keep those things in place, because otherwise little crabs, and especially the European green crabs, like being seen eaten here, those little crabs will come along and eat all of those little snails, and pretty soon the health of the ecosystem goes down because the eelgrass is suffering. Bring back uh, sea otters, they're eating those little crabs, the snails can flourish, and you get the eelgrass beds back again. And if you know anything about estuaries in Oregon and elsewhere, eelgrass is super important uh, habitat for uh, ocean-bound smolts from salmon upstream headed through the estuary and for uh, juveniles of all kinds of uh, marine species. So we might expect, as these losses occur, we might expect that if sea otters come back, there are certain benefits will we'll return to Oregon too which is overall marine productivity will go up, we think. Uh, it'll increase the complexity of food webs, help <coughs> maintain the eggs and larvae, juveniles of all kinds of species that drift in from distant sources. And that's one of the interesting things that I've learned over the years about marine biology is the populations that we see out here of all kinds of things, those didn't just happen here. They drift down as eggs and larvae from somewhere else and settle out here. So it, Kelp forests play a big role in sort of capturing those things out of the water and helping them to retain and settle out here. <clears throat> Same thing with eelgrass. We think there will be big benefits, the ecological uh, benefits from uh, sea otters coming back on eelgrass, which will affect uh, beneficially the water quality in estuaries and the productivity in estuaries. 
and this whole carbon storage thing. Uh, when my son, who is uh, very much uh, steeped in uh, sort of climate science, working a lot on, on environmental issues, came to one of my talks, he said, oh, I get it. Come for the cute and stay for the carbon. So that's what we're, we're advocating to is that's one of the benefits that we now see is being uh, uh, us helping to, to uh, provide. So we think that this might have a lot of cultural, societal impacts. You can think what those might be, in addition to reconnecting the sea otter and the coastal tribes. It would help to improve the habitat that supports all kinds of commercial and recreational fish species. It would help to provide some increased ecosystem resilience, and diversity in the face of these changes and impacts that are being uh, seen in the ocean. Uh, we had a booth at a event in Salem a couple weeks ago called the Saltwater Sportsman Show. It was the, a big arena full of boats and fishing tackle and people, guides and all of that stuff. And uh, we talked to a number of people who were spending a lot of time out on the ocean, in, particularly in a recreational fishing or, or shell fishing environment. And a number of them just said, you know, things aren't right out there. Uh, one man put it, he said, the ocean is groaning. I said, I feel it every time we go out. So it's our hope that by bringing sea otters back, we can help reduce that groan and even eliminate it. We also think that it will be an economic boon for tourism and wildlife viewing, and I can't think of any part of the Oregon coast that where that might be more important than the Wild Rivers Coast here, between Bandon, Port Orford, Gold Beach, and Brookings. So what else might happen to sea otters return? There's likely to be some conflicts, and we are fully aware of those and want to work through them, particularly with the crabbers, commercial crabbers, and the sea urchin guys out of Port Orford, uh, as well as perhaps impacts to recreational uh, fishery, uh, sea, shell fisheries, recreational crabbing and clamming. We think there are ways of limiting uh, that impact, partly because the areas that sea otters occupy and the areas where crab are caught are mostly separate. There are some small areas of overlap, but we think we, we can work through these if we can sit down and, and we want to do that, sit down with the crabbers and others who will work for a living on the ocean. So, here's some things that we need to consider, and one is time. This is going to take some time. We've been at this now a little over two years, and we think it's probably going to take between five and ten years. And at my age, the sooner the better. Uh, we need sustained funding, and that's, of course, an ongoing challenge for any nonprofit. But uh, we need to, so we can plan for and effectively carry out the science needed, the, you know, to get ready for monitoring, to do the assessments, and so on. Uh, we need the cooperative effort of many entities, public and, and private, and we need public support, which is why we're out here tonight talking to you. We have just kicked off a feasibility study. We got some funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we've hired really one of the world-class experts in sea otters to be the lead author on a feasibility study. And that's going to take the next year or more for him to complete that with the help of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee that we are going to be convening. And we will be vetting that through an external panel of experts we don't want anybody at the end of this to think that this thing was just made up. We want to make sure it's the right, the right analysis because uh, nobody wants to go down the wrong trail. We need an economic and social impact assessment. We need to have better understanding of the dollars involved and some of the economic values that could be affected. So that's uh, one that we are still looking for funding for, but we need to, get, need to get that done right away. So there's lots of uncertainties. Uh, none of this is a given. We need a lot more information. Uh, there's issues to be addressed, obviously. And we know that the marine environment is changing even as we speak from human impacts, uh, not the least of which are plastics. And you think about plastics and microfibers in the marine environment and how it affects the food webs. There's things that are, are emerging almost daily that we, we don't fully understand. So again, this is gonna take time. And even if there was a population of sea otters restored, in a particular place, it will take time for those that population to spread uh, up or down the coast for the reasons I talked about earlier. And in any event, we can't predict the outcomes because Mother Nature always bats last. 
So just a little bit about the Alaka Alliance. Uh, we are a nonprofit formally organized in February of 2018. Right now our fiscal sponsor is the Oregon Wildlife Foundation. We are just now submitting our actual 501c3 application on a pain in the neck. <laughs> you think doing your taxes is a pain to you. So at any rate, yeah, we're going to do all that good stuff. This is our board of directors, so you don't necessarily need to look at it all, but uh, Paul's on that list. Uh, uh, several, three tribal members, uh, myself, uh, some folks that have been around this uh, Alaka Alliance for a number of years. We've tried to make it a, a pretty broad and diverse group, and I'm really thrilled with the folks we've got on the board. So we just went through a strategic planning process, thanks to the Meyer Memorial Trust. You know, in those kinds of strategic planning things, you do your visioning and your mission statement and your strategic objectives and all that. But when you boil down to it, this is our vision. Our vision is that 50 years from now, our children and grandchildren and beyond, that they can enjoy and benefit from a healthy sea otter population and the robust marine ecosystem that goes with it and the thriving coastal economy that goes with that. So we have three basic tasks, and this is, there's a lot, a lot that goes into each of those, but the first one is to do the scientific and economic feasibility assessments necessary to support decisions about sea otter restoration. That's why the feasibility study is important. We need to be doing some more uh, habitat uh, assessments in the ocean, and we need to do this economic assessment. We also need to help the region, which means really from north to south and inland, to come to some consensus in the public and various decision makers that restoration is a good thing. And if we can get those two done, then we want to proceed with restoration at a carefully chosen place or places on the Oregon coast, but we're not, we're not there yet. So in 2020, this, this year, we're going to step up our engagement with coastal communities. We just hired, again, thanks to the Meyer Memorial Trust, we just hired a man to be our community relations and outreach person. He couldn't be here tonight, but he will be doing more of this kind of thing. Um, we began the feasibility study. We've begun some work. We need to do more on a research and monitoring plan. This October, we're going to be holding our second Status of Knowledge Symposium. And, and if you sign up on the email list at the back, you will get a quarterly email uh, about our activities, and you'll get more information about this uh, symposium, which will be held in Newport in October, and to which you are invited to come. So we need to uh, build our communications capacity, find long-term funding partners, and so on. So what's your job in this? Your job is to learn about our efforts to learn about sea otters, and you can do that on our website. You can either just Google Alaka Alliance, or you can go to www.elakaalliance.org. Follow us on Facebook. Yes, we do do Facebook, and it's kind of fun because I get to throw little tidbits out there about sea otters and what's going on in the marine environment. We have a YouTube channel where speakers from our symposium two years ago are on that site. Uh, if you sign up for the email newsletter, you'll, you'll find out what's going on and how to, what you might be doing. Uh, volunteer with us. Uh, we, with our new guy on board, we're much more set up to accommodate volunteers. Let us know of other activities that we ought to be out talking to or groups that we ought to be talking to. And um, donate. Obviously, funding is a key to us, so even 20 bucks, 50 bucks helps a lot. And if you go online, you can buy that groovy little otter print that you see there is that was created especially for us. So see ya. Thank you so much. So I told you there were a lot, there were a lot of chapters in the story, so that was a quick quick run through the book. So questions. Yeah. yeah Any yeah. questions is fine. Yeah, Thanks you bet. Questions if you like. Mayor Carl. Yeah, well, I, I was wondering, I, I could have this all along, but I, I was under the impression or thought that uh, within the last few years that, um, I don't know if it was the ODF&W or what have you, but there was a purchase of sea otters from Washington State. Is that, is that correct or do I have that old bogus? Um, you might have dreamed it. <laughs> no, 
No, that, that is possible. Yeah, I have those kinds of dreams too. Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, the CRs that were released out here at Cape uh, Arago and then Port Orford and Redfish Rocks came from the Aleutian Islands uh, in the 70s, 71. And actually there's a funny, oh, it's not funny, haha, -ha, but there's a funny story about all that. All of those introductions in Southeast Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon were sea otters that were captured on Amchitka Island out in the Aleutians in the early late 60s and early 70s. And why is that? Because there was underground atomic testing going on <laughs> at Amchitka Island and the Alaska Fish and Game Department and the predecessor to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided to capture as many animals as they could and get them out of harm's way and farm them out to places where they might do some good. But no, uh, ODFW uh, has not done any uh, sea otter translocation work. Thank you. Yeah, we're working with them about this one, but we're not there yet. Yes, ma'am. Are you planning, uh, long term, planning to put in like a, a, a place that is just for sea otters that they can come to and be somewhere on the coast, maybe several of them, much like the, um, the, 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 the whales, the, not the whales, the, the, what are those, the elephant seals, the elephant seals, the elephant seals that always come back in the same place, those are preserves, people can come and walk and see them, nobody can go down and touch them, so is that your intent? We would love it if we could do that with sea otters. Uh, we will probably use the marine reserves, like the one at Redfish Rock, as areas to either release them or to study them. But the fact is that sea otters, they'll, they'll go where they want to go. The, the uh, things like the elephant seals, the stellar sea lions and so on, those things tend to move back and forth in a migratory pattern, where sea otters don't. So it would be very helpful for us if they would stay in some areas that we could predict, but we really can't predict where they will want to go once we release them. We're hoping those, that we'll choose a place carefully and that they will stick around that spot. Yeah, that they'll like it. Uh, we'll do all we can, we'll put up ribbons, and we'll light the candles and stuff. But in the end, we can't predict where they'll go. If, the, if, if you took them from the Aleutian Islands and brought them down here in the 70s, isn't the waters different in terms of temperature and something like that? It, it might be. Uh, we don't know exactly, but the feasibility study will help us to understand where we should get the animals. But it's highly likely that they will come from southeast Alaska, which is a pretty similar environment to ours in many ways. There may be some supplemental introductions from some of the orphan animals in, South, uh, in, uh, in California that are reared by the aquarium because there's some genetic mixing that we would like to accomplish that the sea otter conservation community would like to achieve. So we may supplement that population with those from California. Part of what dri would drive our consideration is, frankly, what's the red tape involved? Uh, the animals in Alaska are not listed as in, under the Endangered Species Act, although they are covered under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Whereas in California, they're listed as endangered species. So there's not impossible, but the red tape involved is different. So that may influence where we get them. But highly like, there's so many sea otters in southeast Alaska right now. We could go up there with a white van, and I'm sure there are villages that will, would offer us a thousand sea otters tomorrow if we, if we have a way to take them. Any other questions? Just one more, Bob. Looking through the uh, presentation and what have you, I noticed that sometimes they get attacked by sharks and what have you, this food. Do they have any real enemies? No, they don't, other than human beings. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they, they really don't have any natural predators on them. The, the other marine mammals, the big sea lions and elephant seals and so on, uh, don't predate on them. It's been noticed that in the Aleutian Islands, actually, the population of sea otters has gone down because orcas have been eating on them. But that seems to be driven by, wait for this story, it seems to be driven by the fact that after World War II, Japan, Russia, East Germany, and a bunch of the uh, other, Norway and other whaling nations 
really went after the great whales in the North Pacific between you know, Russia, Alaska, and hunted out what was formerly the orca's main prey base. Orcas would follow these great whales and you know, prey on the young, prey on the old. Well, those were gone. So in the next couple decades, the population of stellar sea lions in Alaska and across the Aleutian chain was seen to decline precipitously. And then the seal population started declining. And now we're down to sea otters, which are tiny little food packets. For, I mean, you got, an orca has to eat a lot of these little snacks, uh, sea otter snacks, to, to make up for one big whale. But that's the only instance of uh, a natural predation. Although I must say, and that was sort of one of those National Geographic type videos, some people had set, some researchers had set up a video camera on a remote island, like Kodiak uh, uh, Island, but it wasn't Kodiak. But there were bears on the island, and the bears would wait for the sea otters to haul out on the beach, and then would nail them. <laughs> and if you, you think about that, a big bear can move really fast when they have to. But, so there are, there are opportunities occasionally for other predators, but by and large in the ocean they do not have a, a natural predator. Thank you. Yeah. Other question? Yes, ma'am. What else is the other thing you cited in your regard? Are those coming down past us or are they coming up from our area? Good question. The sea otters seen in Eureka, where might they be from? My personal assessment is it's unlikely they're from the south. That's just such a long, long ways to go, basically against the current. It's more likely they were young males detached again from the Washington population. One of the things that's going on in, in California that's preventing northward movement is the sharks that aggregate seasonally around the Gulf of the Farallon Islands as part of their sort of trans-Pacific seasonal patterns. And these white, great white sharks, and especially the young great white sharks that are learning what's good to eat, kind of prowl around looking for food. And sea otters present an intriguing target. And so one bite from a shark, even if they don't actually eat it, is almost always fatal to a sea otter. So there seems to be a so-called shark fence somewhere between Santa Cruz and San Francisco Bay that is preventing them from moving north. Almost any animal that sticks their head out from the kelp forest <laughs> to the south gets nailed mm -hmm. by great whites. Mm -hmm. So, other questions? I'd be happy to stay and talk if anybody wants to do so. Um, otherwise, I would encourage you to really to sign up for our email list. We promise not to inundate you and we promise to give you useful information. There's a couple of brochures and uh, information for you to take with you if you have other people you want to share it with or just look us up online. Uh, we're working on a new website. We hope to get it up soon, but there is an existing one. Yes, sir. Do the species change any from uh, the habitat north and south? Oh, good question about the difference. Actually, the different subspecies, but yes. Uh, the animals to the north seem to be slightly larger and a little more robust than the ones to the side, their fur tends to be a darker color. The geneticists amongst us say that there's no discernible difference enough to make a subspecies determination. However, their subspecies have been indicated based on morphology, which is size, shape, and color, and that kind of thing. But they can interbreed uh, just fine. And the ones in southeast Alaska are now a composite of animals that survived in Prince William Sound, which were there all along, and animals that were transplanted in from the Aleutian Islands. So those have been all mixed up now. And those are probably also mixing in with the population on the Olympic coast. The only one that's a little more distinct is the southern one off California. And we hope, Oregon historically, based on bones in the, in, and uh, DNA analysis of bones and teeth in the middens from Oregon, compared to the animals today, Oregon was likely a transition zone with characteristics of both the no northern subspecies and the southern subspecies from the south. So we're fairly confident that whichever direction we go, it's more about the habitat than it is about the genetic adaptability of these things.
Yes, ma'am. What happens to the baby otter when the mother goes down in a dark? That's a good question. What happens to the baby otter? <laughs> Often what she will do is to wrap them in kelp so they don't float away. That's the first thing. And, and also to help disguise it uh, so that it doesn't float away. And she's also trying to dive in relatively shallow water, so she's not gone very long. Uh, males, well actually all of them, but males can dive 90 or 100 feet. But females are wanting to dive in 15 to 20 feet of water, max, just because of the time involved to get back to the surface. Smart, now, smarter. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, they're not showing off like the guys. <laughs> yeah, I could go down to 100 feet. <laughs> Um, also, though, in Alaska, it's been observed that female otters, the moms with the pup, are keenly aware of bald eagles, which are lurking around waiting for her to go down so they can nab their pup. And so there's been some observation of behavior that shows, in that case, moms not diving and waiting till either the eagle goes away or darkness falls, and then she does her hunting. So, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm sure it's a, you see others can have anxiety. It would be a source of anxiety for the mom. No, I'm going, I'm going to dive again. So. Any other questions or comments? This has been great, you guys. I appreciate it. Stay tuned for us. Um, and uh, I, uh, I appreciate the support and everybody coming out this evening. And wash your hands. Okay? That goes for you, too, at home. <laughs> Before you leave, thank you again for coming down and spending some time to tell us about these amazing animals, which we all sort of love um, from you cartoons and everything else. I know, I know, they're adorable and they love to cuddle. Uh, what I wanted to tell you guys uh, that I did not say earlier is that this is brought to you by the Curry Watersheds Partnership, which is the Lower Road and yeah. South Road, which Mary took charge of for like over 20 years. Yeah. Right, is here too. She now yeah. is doing uh, in that position and. The Lower Rogue Watershed Council and the district, the uh, Curry Soil and Water Conservation District. So it's all of us together that we bring these to you guys. And so I appreciate everybody coming out. And I want to tell you about one cool opportunity on the 27th. Super different than what we've normally done, but it's a full day workshop and it's going to be on biochar. So we're doing kind of a half classroom session here, um, which will be really, really informative. And then we're going to go out in the field. Um, we're going to go over to Jeff Knox's, the Knox's property on Indian Creek. And then we're going to do actual burning, and everybody will get to go home with some biochar to put on their own properties, um, which will be really cool. So I hope if you have some time, you can you join us. What? Gonna we're going to burn some slash. Hey. We're going to turn it into carbon sequestering. Who's bringing the beer? Me. Me. Oh. Yeah, usually. Um, beer with your Yeah, you, you should have a beer while you're yeah, soaking up fire. Awesome. Take that down as a no, Brandon. Uh, yeah, so anyway, join us uh, March 27th if you guys are available. And again, thank you. You're welcome. Thank I'm you so much. Thank you all.